What? I know it's still filming. It's okay. I'm going to edit all this out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In Denver Snuffer's book, Passing the Heavenly Gift, he argued that Joseph Smith did practice polygamy. However, since that book was written, he has changed his mind on that and believes Joseph was a monogamist. How did he change? We're going to talk about his rationalizations for that in our next conversation. You won't want to miss it. Check it out. A couple other things that I want to talk about since we're talking about your scriptures. Um, and I guess I should mention, uh, I, one, I've read your book, uh, Passing the Heavenly Gift. Um, one of the things that and, I... And you're willing to admit that? Are you, do you still have a temple recommend? <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we should, we should probably talk about that one because that was a bit of a controversial book. Um, and, and, and I do want to talk about the history of that. But, but the reason why I bring it up in the context of your scriptures is uh, when I read it, um, one of the interesting things to me was your, your take on um, Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And uh, from what I understand, you had said, and I've heard various things, so maybe you can clear up this, but when you wrote in Passing the Heavenly Gift, you had mentioned there were really, it was really four revelations. And I like, I like that interpretation. I don't know that I, I necessarily agree that that's historically accurate, but um, I, and I understand, so I'm curious if you still stand behind what you've written, because I understand you've kind of evolved on your beliefs about polygamy. So can you talk about that? Um, like any uh, interested and attentive Latter-day Saint, um, my understanding of the history of what happened in the early church began using uh, the B.H. Roberts material, the uh, Joseph Smith history as gathered by B.H. Roberts. Um, uh, I, I got baptized um, September 10th of 1973. There was a lady in our ward that ran a 70s mission bookstore. I don't know if anyone in your audience is old enough to remember 70s mission bookstores. So Ann Wilde, I interviewed her and she mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, um, it was on her porch. I bought and I read, you know, the autobiography of uh, Parley Pratt. I read all the biographies of Heber C. Kimball, John Taylor. I, I read the, the uh, what is it, seven-volume set by uh, B.H. Roberts. I read the, um, uh, the, the multiple-volume set that was attributed to Joseph Smith that is the forerunner of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. I, I read everything I could get my hands on in order to try and understand. I mean, if this is really the work of God, if, 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 if God restored something, he's speaking again. I mean, he hasn't done that since we close out the New Testament record. Now he's speaking and stuff is rolling forth that, that tells us the mind of God. Then we ought to, we ought to pay particular attention. So in, in the era that I came in, that 1973 time frame, you're really looking at, at leadership that consists of um, Joseph Fielding Smith's son-in-law, Bruce R. McConkie, who's the doctrinal go-to guy. You've, you've got, uh, you know, Marion Romney, he can stand his own. You've got Mark Peterson, who thinks he's all that on doctrine. And... Uh, you know, you, you had, uh, well, in Eldon Tanner was a money guy, um, but uh, you, you've got men up there, Boyd K. Packer, who ran CES at the time. Um, you got men who have really strong opinions and essentially a consensus about what was and what was not history. And then uh, you, you wind up with Arrington, and Arrington winds up hiring uh, D. Michael Quinn, and then Arrington appears to go a little off the reservation, and D. Michael Quinn appears to go way off the reservation. And um, my initial reaction to what D. Michael Quinn did was to think, what, a, what an awful, 
What an awful turn of events that, that a man would apostasy and then turn around and, and trash the, the history of the Restoration in this wretched fashion. But it was Michael Quinn's work that got me looking for and trying to find original source material. Um, Michael Quinn donated a bunch of the material that he had to Yale University and then Signature Books had someone go back to Yale University or maybe they went back on their own and Signature was just the ones that would print it. And so these diaries and these journals begin to roll out that is the source material from which Michael Quinn drew his conclusions because he had access to and made copies from the church archives that weren't particularly open. Arrington made them open somewhat, but, but they weren't particularly open. So church history was written from a closed point of view, a controlled point of view. And Michael Quinn actually represents sort of opening the door and seeing behind the orthodox interpretation. So, right. so the materials that Michael Quinn made available became available, and this, this orthodox traditional view of history, which I understood well. I mean, I had studied it. I, I was a uh, Fielding Smith, McConkie, Packer disciple, and to me, Michael Quinn's view was heretical. But as you begin to examine the source material from which Michael Quinn drew his conclusions, you begin to see that, that in some respects, he's not um, at all unfair. And in some ways, he's not just fair, but he's, he's kindly. He's, he's being um, sympathetic in his viewpoint. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble because what he wrote had a far different look and feel than the look and feel that you get from this other narrative. So passing the heavenly gift was an attempt to take a whole nother bundle of source material that existed and was available. And I'd gone to the trouble of buying these, these small print you know, 300 copies were all that were ever put in print. But Kurt Bench over at Benchmark is uh, one of the outlets that sells this stuff. So I was able to access these diaries, these journals, and to look at it myself. And uh, my attitude towards Michael Quinn changed considerably. And my view of what the church was doing with their history changed considerably. But... Of all the subjects that are out there, probably the most controversial, internationally known, um, dramatic topic of all is the plural marriage subject. And I mean, I, I don't want to get really granular about it, but to me, it required over 40 years of research to reach a conclusion. It wasn't, it wasn't a single view. I mean, if you're going to read everything that is said by the um, advocates and the defenders of the plural marriage establishment through Joseph Smith, um, you have a library of material that you're going to have to plow through. And if you're going to say, OK, what? Um, what are the arguments then on the other side of the coin about the issue of plural marriage? Because you've got, you've got Emma denying that Joseph ever practiced that. But you also have incidents in which um, Emma Smith was present in something that happened that William McClellan tries to sensationalize in his account talking about his discussion with Emma about the very incident that you're talking about. And then you've got Joseph's view of that, and you've got Oliver Cowdery's accusation and the minutes of the High Council in Far West, 
when Oliver Cowdery was disciplined for what he was saying about that same incident. You're talking about Fanny Alger. The Fanny Alger stuff. And, and you've got all of this, the, these points to triangulate from. You know, what are you to make of it? I can, I can tell you that story and make Joseph Smith an adulterer and a, a plural marriage practitioner, or I can tell you that story and I can make Joseph Smith absolutely chaste and that what happened there was not uh, by any stretch a sexual liaison. Um, Fanny Alger would have nine children from a husband. Uh, Joseph Smith fathered eight children through Emma Smith. They were both at the peak of their fertility when the two of them had something going on, and yet there was no progeny, there was no child. In fact, there's no child born that was fathered by Joseph Smith other than the children that came through Emma Smith. So if you're going to turn Joseph Smith into something that is akin to the narrative tour by the LDS Church, one of the questions that ought to enter into your balancing of what happened is the absence of any progeny when you've got a fertile man and you've got fertile women who bore children to other men but never bore a child for Joseph Smith, what effect ought that have on your thinking and interpretation of the historical events? And you got Emma Smith's denial that anything had gone on. So um, it's, it's a long, arduous process to get through enough of the source material in order to form a fair opinion. And even after you form a fair opinion, and the one I had initially in passing the heavenly gift reached was that if, um, if people are reliable, and one of the stories of the angel with the drawn sword comes from um, Eliza Snow. And Eliza Snow is someone for whom I had some respect. Um, so I'm going to give credence to that because of her. And the story that she tells suggested that um, something happened in order to provoke Joseph to initially begin implementation of something that Joseph Smith was reluctant to implement. Well, um, you go to the high council minutes in Far West, and Joseph is acquitted, and Oliver Cowdery is convicted of slandering him, and everyone heard it. You go to the incident in Nauvoo when Joseph dictated a revelation in July of 1843. It was written down by William Clayton. Hiram Smith took the revelation. It was read to the High Council of Nauvoo. The High Council minutes in Nauvoo talk about what was read to them. And they say it's an explanation of an ancient order of things and it has nothing to do with some practice today. How do you reconcile all of the different triangulation points? Because this now is a contemporary statement, both in the High Council in Far West and the High Council in, in Nauvoo. These are contemporaneous things that suggest there's a problem with the narrative that Joseph is out there betting women, uh, including in the most outrageous form, betting young teenagers. Well. Uh, to his credit, when he wrote Rough Stone Rolling, Bushman grapples with this issue. Uh, he comes down on the side of the historical storytelling, but he says that, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close. Uh, he says that um, Joseph Smith was not a Lothario and that he didn't father children with other children, he, with other women that his desire for sealing appears to be related to plentitude in the afterlife. 
plentitude in the afterlife. Well, somewhere along the line, the idea of sealing and the idea of marriage become one and the same and they overlap into, well, if someone's sealed, then someone's married. And it's not at all clear. If, if you go back, it's really hard for people to um, accept this idea. Well, I had dinner with Michael Quinn, and I, I posed this. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I posed this to him over dinner. I said, okay, let's take June 27th, 1844, and let's say right there, that's the end of the historical that's the, record. That's the death of Joseph Smith. Yes, that's the day Joseph is killed in okay. Hiram. That's the end. You, you consider nothing that got written down or got introduced after June 27, 1844, and you are limited absolutely to the material that got its existence put pen to paper before that date. Okay. What do you have? What do you have to support Joseph Smith practicing plural marriage with sexual relations with other women than Emma? It was an interesting dinner. It was an interesting evening. We had an interesting conversation. He, well, I don't know if I had a quote him. I don't know if your listeners are going to be offended. But it, we got on that topic because he said that his... His reaction to my position on the plural marriage subject was bullshit. And I said, well, okay, then let's, let's start with the proposition <laughs> that we're going to take June 27th and we're only going to go before. And we went back and forth for a few minutes, and he said, I see where you're coming from. Because if you consider the source material that only was extant so, so on that date. So you throw out all the Temple Lot case and everything because it's after June 27th. Yeah, all of that stuff. All of the affidavits got gathered. Look, the idea that you get to practice plural wivery is not made public until 1852 in a general conference talk in which uh, Orson, Orson uh, Pratt was assigned to introduce the topic by Brigham Young, and then Brigham gets up, and and then you've got the the, the historian, uh, the assistant historian that had worked in uh, in Nauvoo and who was working in in Salt Lake under the leadership of um, uh, Kimball um, running the historian's office. And he says in one of his diary entries that the records that they brought with them from Nauvoo, the records were being altered to conform to the new regime. You're talking about Heber Kimball? No, he worked under Heber Kimball. Oh. Um, his name will occur to me in a minute, but but he wrote in his diary, who's working under that that the records were now being altered in order to fit the new uh, the new system of things, the new mm -hmm. regimen, um, and and so you have to question if they're willing to go so far as to interlineate and alter original source material, including William Clayton's own diary being altered. Uh, one entry that you can see in the Joseph Smith papers has this, this incredibly innocent statement that uh, is, is about uh, fidelity and monogamy, and it's turned into a statement about how only one man at a time has the authority to, uh, to introduce the plural wife system, and that he, Joseph, was that guy. From interlineations, um, I've, I've written about all this. Anyway, the, the, the fact is that if you confine yourself to what existed at the time that Joseph was alive, you have a very, very difficult time saying that there is evidence Joseph did anything other than practice something called sealing that was designed to create plentitude in the afterlife. Joseph Smith, as Bushman described it, wanted large families to go into the eternities. In um, John Taylor's book, The Government of God, he asserts that the government of God in eternity is the family. So if Joseph Smith is trying to restore on earth the family of God, 
the way in which you restore the family of God is to bind people together into some sealed family connection. Doesn't matter that um, they're married to one another. If you seal them together, you seal people into a family relationship that can exist on into eternity. So Joseph doesn't use the word adoption in the context of sealing until October of 1843. In the Joseph Smith papers, that's the earliest date I can find that in his diaries that the word adoption uh, gets used. Well, it was in the law of adoption. Yeah, um, a very misunderstood concept, but Joseph practiced something that was adoption. But apparently the introduction of that occurs in about the October 1843 time frame. Um, until then, if you're talking sealing, without defining what sealing meant, you weren't using the word adoption, you were using the word marriage in people's projection of what the word meant backward. If the sealing that took place was some form of familial tie that was designed to bind together as a family to Joseph, who had uh, a connection that had been made to heaven, then what was being sealed was a family and not um, a sexual partner. Um, but beginning in that October 1843 time frame, there, there comes out something that results in um, adoption. Joseph will be dead within six months. Between the October mention and the time of his death six months later, there really isn't enough time in order to develop um, even, a, even an adequate historical record of what Joseph was doing with the idea of adoption in that, in that time period. It gets mentioned. And then what happens is that following his death, by the time you get to the 1845 November to February 1846 time period, there is adoption practice going on. The, the language that we get in, in the word and the will of the Lord um, about captains of 50 and captains of 100 is actually, it's, it's actually kind of code for public consumption. That was adoption practice going on in the Nauvoo era. So... Um, Set that aside for just a moment. Adoption being the organization of the companies that uh, were assigned and organized through temple ceremonies and adoption process preliminary to the migration, the abandonment of the, the Nauvoo Temple, the, the companies migrating out into the Salt Lake Valley. And um, they practiced something called adoption. Then, as they migrate across, there are these conversations that enter into journals. One of the funniest to me is John D. Lee's journal, where he's talking about someone asking John D. Lee to be sealed to him, adopted to him, uh, because it's going to increase his kingdom. And John D. Lee saying, why would I be adopted to you, why don't you be adopted to me so I get to be the, the, the boss in the afterlife in the government it's, it's of God. It's all a great pyramid scheme, right? It's, yeah, it's all just fabulously stupid because they're, they're, they're aspiring. If this stuff be truthful, holy, and sacred, they're aspiring to manipulate the afterlife by having introduced to them a concept that Joseph only had a six month time period between introduction and death, and it doesn't get fleshed out. Then you, you have to go to many, many years later when you have journal entries by Cannon and by Taylor and by um, Pratt, Hyde, and, and their, their conversations and the notes of meetings that they held where they say things like, I never understood what Joseph Smith was doing with adoption. Cannon goes so far as to say, I didn't believe it when he introduced it, and I don't believe it now. 
And so the concept of adoption just drifts into wreckage. And, and adoption as a, as a concept related to sealing turns into mush and it, it gets abandoned. It wind up being a fight. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Denver Snuffer. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about the succession crisis, and Denver will talk about how Brigham Young justified his ascension to the leadership of the LDS Church. Brigham Young spent several days trying to persuade Wilford Woodruff that he, Brigham Young, needed to be elected president. They needed a president, and Woodruff wouldn't relent. His position was... We, it required a revelation to reorganize the First Presidency. And um, Brigham Young's position was it didn't require a revelation, it just required a vote. That Joseph Smith got made president by revelation or by a vote of the, the, the group. He did not get made president by a revelation. Common consent. Yeah, it was just an election. It was just, and that he could be elected the same way and it would have exactly the same effect. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on facebook.com slash gospel tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at gospel tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.